Hey everyone, Dr. Jack Cordy, and this is the final video in a series breaking down this research paper here. Now I actually go back several videos to break down some of the fundamentals about how inflammation contributes to Alzheimer's disease through the NLRP3 receptor, and so perhaps inhibiting the NLRP3 receptor will be therapeutic in Alzheimer's disease. Then I go through this paper and how we discovered this group of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories inhibits NLRP3 by inhibiting chloride efflux, which is an essential central component of NLRP3 activation. But up until then, figures one, two, th and three of this paper, they haven't touched on Alzheimer's disease, even though that's in the title of the paper. And it's figure four, and this is where uh, my input to the paper really uh, came in, because I work a lot with mice and behavior and all those kinds of stuff, immunohistochemistry stainings of the brain. So this is when I really started to contribute to the paper. We wanted to test, do these drugs work in an animal model of Alzheimer's disease that we know NLRP3 might be involved in? Okay, so let's jump into it. First up, now, Alzheimer's genetic models, which I've covered, which is when you genetically engineer a mouse to have familial Alzheimer's disease genes, they take time. They take a year until you get cognitive deficits. And then you have to do behavioral tasks on it. And so it can be a good two year project trying to find out can we inhibit, can we ther be therapeutic in Alzheimer's mouse models? So it's not really the model that you want to jump into immediately. So the first model we jumped into was injecting high concentrations of amyloid into the ventricles of rat brains. So to do this, we do stereotactic uh, surgery, which is where we essentially, under anesthesia, lock the rat into a grid, so then we can exactly uh, pr precision a needle into a specific location to hit these tiny ventricles in the brain. So we need to use these precision in instruments in order to do an injection at a very specific location in the brain within the rat. Now we have to drill a small hole in the skull before we lower this needle down to inject it. Then we inject a high dose of amyloid and that will very rapidly induce memory deficits and neuroinflammation in these animals. So we did this to the rats and just after the injection we gave our non-steroidal anti-inflammatories that we know inhibit the NLRP3 inflammasome or we gave a placebo control. Then we measured their memory deficits using the novel object task. So just a quick refresher is you put a mouse or a rat in an arena with two identical objects, so two brown squares, for example. And then after a period of time, you take the animal out, you clean the arena, but you swap out one of the objects. So now there's a new object and an object it's already seen before. You pop the rodent back in and it should spend more time around the new object. And that's because rodents like new things. They should remember that they've seen the brown square and spend more time with the blue squiggle. But a mouse with very poor memory will spend an equal time around both objects because it can't figure out which one's the one it's seen before, it can't remember it, and which one's the new object. So both objects appear to be new to a mouse with very poor memory. So at 14 days with these rats, we found that um, the control animals that hadn't been administered amyloid could distinguish between the new object and the old object, and they spent more time around the new object. The rats injected with amyloid couldn't distinguish and um, spent equal time around the old object and the new object. And when we gave them epinemic acid, we reversed them back to that control phenotype so they could remember. So we blocked the memory deficits induced by amyloid. And this was 14 days after injection. We also did it again 35 days after injection and we got the same results. So it's a long lasting effect, this mepinamic acid injection. Now that's a very artificial model of Alzheimer's, but it is a great little check before you embark on something much bigger involving genetic models. So in this one, we did a genetic model. It's actually called the three times TG Alzheimer's mouse model. And in this one, it's got two uh, mutations in the amyloid protein, and actually it has a mutation in tau, and that induces phosphorylated tau to try to get you that tau tangle part of the Alzheimer's mouse model. Now that's a little weird because there are no tau mutations that cause Alzheimer's disease. Tau mutations typically cause other forms of dementia like frontal temporal dementia. 
And so that's a con, but a pro is that this animal gets all the histological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. It gets neuronal loss, tau tangles, amyloid, and inflammation. Whereas the amyloid-based models typically just get um, amyloid pathology, inflammation, and they don't get neuronal loss or tau tangles. So you get all the histological hallmarks with this mouse model, but it's kind of artificial because you have this weird tau mutation in there. Anyway, so that's the mouse model. It's called 3 times TG um, Alzheimer's mouse model. And in that we, um, under the skin, we slipped um, a thing called osmotic mini pump. This is a very, very cool piece of technology, right? So let me try and explain it to you, right? So here we have the administration tube. We have this cap here that seals the osmotic mini pump. And then here we have a we have essentially a bladder with our reservoir of our drug. And we put our drug in there at an incredibly high concentration. So it's a very high concentration of our drug. Then out here we have sort of a salt-based layer. So it's a really salty substance. And then out here we have a hard capsule um, that's permeable to water. So we have a hard capsule that's permeable to water. We have a thick crust of salt. Then we have our bladder with a drug. And then we have our administration tube coming out the end there. So what happens when you slip this device under the skin of an animal, the water in the animal is going to go up towards and through the permeable capsule to the salt layer within the osmotic mini pump. And that's because of osmosis. Osmosis, salt, sucks. Water goes from a high concentration of water to a low concentration of water. So that um, salty, briny layer has a very low concentration of water and a high concentration of salt. So water must flow through the semi-permeable membrane from the high concentration of water down to the low concentration of water. And all that water rushing into the salt layer applies pressure on the bladder. The bladder starts to squeeze and then drug will now drip out the end there. Now, I said a very high concentration of drug because a very small amount of liquid comes out. One to two microliters a day. So it's a tiny amount of drug will get squeezed out at the end of the day. But that's really good because that means it will administer the drug for 28 days straight. So this way we don't have to inject the mice every, 28, every day for 28 days, which it comes with ethical issues and all that kind of jazz. We can just slip this under the skin and it will administer the drug continuously for 28 days. So that's what we did. And we gave it to them at the one year mark. This is right when you would expect to see cognitive deficits. So right at the beginning, just when they're about to tip, so I would say it's like giving it to a patient with mild cognitive impairment. So a patient comes in, concerned they've got Alzheimer's disease, they haven't got full-blown Alzheimer's disease, so they've just got mild cognitive impairment, they're forgetting their keys, losing their car, parked car, that kind of thing. And perhaps they're also amyloid positive. So you've done a PET imaging and you found your patient is amyloid positive. Now you'll be like, oh, let's give them this drug. So that's about what I would say is the equivalent to what we've done here. So then for 28 days, right when we expect the cognitive deficits to hit, um, we are giving them the drug. And then after that, we measure their cognitive performance. And we used the novel object task. We also did the Y-Maze task as well. And we basically found that, here we go, we've got our wild type mice. They could distinguish between the novel object and the uh, familiar object, the object, the familiar object, the object that I've seen before. Here's our Alzheimer's mouse. Terrible performance, can't recognize between the old object and the new object. Here's the mephanemic acid mice. Now, I've I got to say, like, all my research is done blinded, right? So... I don't know even if it's an Alzheimer's mouse or if it's a mephanemic, uh, mephanemic acid mouse. I don't know if it's had the NSAIDs, if it's an Alzheimer's mouse when I'm doing the experiment. I just put the mice in, I do the maze, I score the maze, I track the maze. All of that's done blinded. I even do the immunochemistry blinded. I do the whole thing blinded. I don't even know the groups. And then I come to unblinding. Now, at this stage, I'd done a PhD and a postdoc. So I'd gone through unblinding, you know, maybe eight times. And every time it had been negative. Every time the unblinding experience was horrible because I could see that the numbers were even as I, uh, as I organized the data after unblinding. 
This was the first time in my career I unblinded and all the small values went to one group and all the big values went to the other groups and I couldn't believe what was happening. I was there with an undergrad named Sophie because we were working on this and we were screaming and jumping around at like 9pm at night on a Friday after unblinding this data. It couldn't have been more exciting. <laughs> Oh gosh, it was good. I, just talking about it, I'm reminiscing about how good this unblinding experience was. Um, definitely the, one of the few times in my career unblinding was a joyful occasion. Because surprisingly, it's hard to cure disease. So um, unsurprisingly. Next, we did immunistic chemistry and we did this all blinded as well and then unblinded. Now, immunistic chemistry, we stained for microglia and we stained for pro interleukin 1b which will be inside of the cell just to see if they're more inflamed by looking at that interleukin 1 beta now microglia you can kind of tell whether they're activated or not so here we have a resting microglia and here we have activated microglia so you can see that they go up so they're normally out there sensing the extracellular environment and when they detect something that they're concerned about they normally migrate to it and then retract their processes and then start releasing cytokines or phagocytosing what they've found. So they normally retract in in order to activate. So there's several levels of activation. This is a single microglia and this is like five microglia in a cluster all really activated. So I developed the scale to decide whether they were activated or not activated. So here we have an Alzheimer's mouse, and this is just in the subiculum, which is a, a memory location part of the brain right beside the hippocampus. So this is just in the subiculum, and this is where the pathology starts in these mice. Um, and here we can see the microglia have very short processes. They look very angry, and they're yellow because they're both positive for red, which is interleukin-1 beta, and green, which is microglia. So by being positive for both, they, they turn up yellow. So here we have some very small activated microglia that are positive for both interleukin-1 beta and they've pulled in their, uh, their processes and they're very active in green. So here is what it looks like when you give me phenemic acid. It's insane. The unblinding was insane when it came to this, right? Because we scored all the images blinded so we didn't know which groups they belonged to. And then when we unblinded, we couldn't believe what had happened. This drug had just turned off the inflammatory response in these microglia like a light switch. It was so exciting. Most of this work was done by Sophie. So thanks, Sophie, uh, by the way, um, uh, who did this. Awesome stuff. Gosh, ah, I just want to sit on this image for a while because it's so cool. Okay, so we, then we scored it, right? So this is percentage microglia activated. This is Alzheimer's disease. This is methanemic acid. And this is percentage of microglia positive for interleukin 1 beta. And so there's a very high percentage, up to 40%. And then down here, we dropped it reasonable, um, but not completely. We were surprised by how much interleukin 1 beta positive cells there were altogether, really, but way more in the Alzheimer's mice. And that was reversed with methanemic acid. So super exciting. So... Figure four can be summarized. Can NLRP3 inhibiting NSAIDs be therapeutic in Alzheimer's disease rodent models? And the answer is yes. In both an acute amyloid model in which we and a genetic model of Alzheimer's disease, NLRP3 inhibit in inhibiting NSAIDs improve memory. And we saw a prevent, maybe reverse, microglial inflammatory morphology and IL-1 beta expression. So that was super exciting. Essentially, we found an existing old class of drugs had this new twist in the tail. It could also inhibit NLRP3 by inhibiting this chloride flux, probably. And by doing so, it was therapeutic in Alzheimer's disease. And that was the end of this paper. I will say I then released another paper, which was really, really cool, where it's like these are existing drugs. So why don't we go look in the population to see if people who are taking the NLRP3 inhibiting NSAIDs have a slower Alzheimer's decline. And indeed, that's exactly what we found. People who were taking ibuprofen um, with Alzheimer's disease had a regular, normal progression of the disease compared to someone who wasn't taking ibuprofen they had the exact same progression and in fact we t tested about seven different NSAIDs including a non uh, not an NSAID called paracetamol and we found that the only NSAID that slowed the progression of Alzheimer's disease was the only one in the data set that inhibited NLRP3 so um, it was an amazing result um, so we've kind of confirmed this in human studies as well so it's very exciting um, and that, that came out two years later after this paper. Awesome. So that's my breakdown. Uh, I hope that was as exciting for you as it was for me. It was so exciting to just go over this data. Still to this day, probably some of the best data I've ever produced. Um, super exciting. Thanks, everyone.